Want to know how you quit this game? You type in the code QUIT on the title screen. And yes, I tried entering dirty words, and no, they didn't do anything. Heck, even Bubble Bobble got that part right. Today in Ancient DOS games, we're taking a look at Impact, which was known by North American gamers such as myself as Blockbuster. Today's not going to be a very long review because there's surprisingly little to say about this game, but I wanted to talk about it because it's very unique as far as breakout clones go. Specifically, it uses the same kind of power-up system as the Gradius games, and I don't think there's any other breakout clones that do that. That said, this game really isn't that great, but we'll get into more details after the game stats. Impact, aka Blockbuster, was created by Audiogenic Software for a large variety of systems in 1987, and while they self-published most of them, the DOS version specifically was published by Mindscape in the Americas in 1988, and by Digital Integration in the European market in 1990 under their Action 16 brand. It's a one-player breakout clone with support for both CGA 4 color and EGA 16 color graphics at 320 by 200 resolution, but it only supports the PC speaker for sound effects. As for its current release date, it's still commercial, and finding a copy nowadays is, um, pretty difficult. But really, this game is so simple in its approach, you could probably download something like Game Maker and make a game just like this one on only a few days of effort, if even. So as with any breakout clone, the objective of each screen is to break all the bricks and head on to the next level. Simple enough. But along the way, you'll have a number of things to contend with. The very first thing you'll notice in this game is the power upgrade in the bottom right corner. The very second thing you'll notice is that your paddle is tiny. I mean seriously, in most good breakout games, the paddle size is at least 5-6 to six times the size of the ball. In this game, the paddle size is a mere 2.5 times the size of the ball. It is absolutely tiny, and as a result, it's extremely difficult to keep the ball in play, especially if you're using the keyboard instead of the mouse. Anyways, back to the power-ups. There are nine different power-ups you can acquire, but to get them you need to collect U-shaped tokens that drop from the bricks you destroy. Each time you collect a token, an indicator moves across the power-up grid to the next item on the grid. When the power-up you want is selected, you simply hit the second mouse button to activate it. The fun thing about this is that if you collect enough tokens, you can activate several power-ups at once. Want a magnet paddle plus a laser? No problem. Need a wide paddle to help you keep your buzzsaw ball in play? Easy stuff. The only catch is that the power-up selection doesn't always get updated when you collect a token, and there can be a delay of up to several seconds sometimes. I'm not really sure what causes this delay, but it's definitely present. Worse, if you lose your ball before the delay catches up, the tokens that were in queue are lost. Strangely, I don't remember there being a delay when I was playing this back in the late 80s, so this could be related to the DOSBox version I'm using. More on that later. Now, I don't remember all of the power-ups by name, and I wasn't able to find my old manual, let alone a manual online that would help, but at least I remember some of them. So here we go. First is the slowdown power-up, which slows the ball down a little. Next is the magnet paddle, which lets you catch the ball with your paddle and release it wherever you want. Next is triple ball, which splits the ball into three at once. And there's two things to note about this one. The first is that activating it will deactivate the magnet paddle if it's active. And also, the balls can actually bounce off of each other, which which is kind of weird since in most breakout clones, multiple balls can't hit each other. In the next row down, we have the extended paddle, which is slightly bigger than the normal paddle, but not by much. Next is the flashlight, which causes all invisible bricks to permanently become visible. Next we have the laser gun, which shoots a pulse of laser energy that can destroy bricks and enemies. You have to be careful with the laser though, because some levels actually have bricks that can reflect laser shots back at you, making the game just that much more evil. 
The last row of power-ups includes the bomb, which you have to activate twice. You have to first press the second mouse button to arm it, and then you have to activate it with the first mouse button, which not only blows up all the enemies on screen, but prevents new enemies from spawning for the rest of the level. It's very handy if the enemies are firing their own weapons at you. And yeah, the enemies in this game can shoot back in certain levels, though there can only be a certain number of enemy shots on screen at any one time, and they don't move very fast, so they're usually easy enough to dodge. Next up are the missiles, which you can only fire three times, but each missile can take out an entire column of bricks. Lastly is the buzzsaw ball. This turns the ball into a flashing wheel of death that destroys everything in its path. Uh, except for immune bricks, which the ball just simply passes through them. The bricks themselves come in several flavors and can actually be mixed and matched. For example, there can be invisible multi-hit bricks, immune reflective bricks, or even immune invisible reflective bricks. Of specific note, though, are the levels with the bonus bricks. Many, though not all of the levels, have the letters B, O, N, U, and S arranged in various patterns. If you break all five of these bricks with the ball in the right order, you get an extra life. Now the order is important, as if you go out of order you'll lose your chance to get an extra life, and also you have to use the ball. Using the laser or the missiles doesn't count. So yeah, if you haven't figured it out yet, this game is really hard, but for the wrong reasons. The speed is horribly inconsistent, the paddle's way too small for its own good, the bricks can be deceptive, but I haven't even gotten to the worst part yet. As I previously stated, some of the bricks can be invisible. Well, if they're not also immune to damage, you still have to take them out, even if all the visible bricks are gone. And this is a rule that should never be violated with a breakout clone. If all visible bricks are gone, you should be able to move on, because trying to find an aim for one or more invisible bricks is just ridiculous, annoying, and not fun. Now there is the flashlight power-up of course, but if you've exhausted the supply of tokens in the level without using it, then even that's not an option. To the game's credit though, you don't have to play any of the 80 built-in levels. Instead, you can make and play your own. On the title screen where you enter your password to continue playing, you simply have to type in edit and you're taken to the editor. The editor controls do take a bit of getting used to, but thankfully pressing escape will bring them all up so you don't have to immediately memorize them or anything. Then to play the levels you made with the editor, you just enter the code user on the title screen and there you go. There is a bug with the editor, unfortunately. Each level is supposed to have its own stats, but the two kill stat, which determines how many hits the multi-hit bricks take, is universal to all of the levels you make. Which kind of sucks, but what are you going to do? Actually, I think I spent more time using this game's editor than playing the actual game. But yeah, not really much else to say, really. As unique as this game is, it's simply got a lot of issues which stand in the way of it being fun. Really, unless you're a diehard collector of old DOS games, European games, or breakout clones, there really isn't anything here for you. That said, the editor works well enough, and as surprising as it might seem, that's a pretty rare feature for a breakout style game. Though if you want a better breakout clone with a built-in editor, get yourself a copy of Arkanoid 2 Revenge of Doe instead. As for DOSBox settings, you need to set a ridiculously low cycles count for this thing to play at even a remotely acceptable speed. I recommend a setting of a mere 100 cycles for the EGA mode, less if you want to play the CGA version. Also, you're going to need an older version of DOSBox to play this game. If you try playing this game in the most recent version of DOSBox, it kind of locks up right before asking you if you want to use the keyboard or mouse. The latest version of DOSBox that will run this game properly is version 0.72. Thankfully, you can have multiple versions of DOSBox installed at a time without any issues, so don't worry about having to install an old one to play this game. Anywho, that's all for this episode of Ancient DOS Games. Stay tuned for episode 58, where we're going to take a look at a game that has both a censored and an uncensored storyline, which you can swap between when you start the game. If you think you know which game wants to do that, then send your guests to adg at pixelships.com and tune in next Saturday to see it in action.